Hey everyone, need something to get you going in the morning or the afternoon? Check out TrenchCoffeeCo.com. Trench Coffee originated in Las Vegas and is owned by a combat controller and his wife. Uh, they've been making coffee as a hobby for a couple of years and then decided they enjoyed it so much and they wanted to share the coffee wealth with everyone else. So check them out. They've got 10 different brews. They originally started with the Trench Blend. Um, but they recently started a new blend that uh, is kind of my personal favorite, which is the Brazil Cerrado. I'm probably saying that wrong again, like I do in every single promo, um, but whatever. I'm educated in South Carolina, so you can deal with it. Uh, they also sell, you know, apparel. They sell cold brew kits. They've got holiday packages going on where you can get a mug and some coffee. Uh, their normal bag sizes are 12 ounces. They do have some samplers. So if you wanted to get a handful of sampler packs, you could do that. And if you want to go all in, they definitely have five pound bags that'll keep you stocked for quite some time. Um, but if you go through coffee like I do, because it's so good, five pounds probably won't last you too long. But please go check them out. Uh, they are definitely friends of the podcast and have been for quite some time. And uh, so we want to support them and they're supporting us. Uh, so we don't get anything from it, but please go check them out. Enter the promo code ones ready to get you a discount. And then I know that sometimes they also, every time you buy a, a bag of coffee and use our promo code, they will send a bag down range or at least put some money to the side to pay for sending bags down range. So great company, great people. Jeff and Jerrica are amazing. So go support them. Check them out. Trench Coffee Co. That's trenchcoffeeco.com. I got to go. What's up, everybody? Uh, welcome to the team room. We're back. It's our normal early morning record. We have something special for you. Since we have since we put out our first sauce episode or special operations surgical team, we're going to figure out how to say it today, too. Some people say sauce oh, tea, yeah. but that's redundant. If you say sauce tea team, eh, it doesn't matter. Anyway, we brought back one of our favorite sauce tea professionals. Uh, it's, it's major now, Emily Offer, I believe. Did it I promote is. you or is it? Nope. Oh, yeah. Promotion. Major Emily Offer. <laughs> I'm hey, so guys, happy for you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. No problem. We'll start off with a little bit about yourself. You can tell us as much about yourself or as little about yourself, but it helps for people to have a background on you. So I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. So um, I have been in sauce for about two and a half years now. I have a little bit of enlisted background. I started out um, when I was actually in college. I enlisted in the guard when I was in nursing school. So I was in the Missouri Guard, enlisted as a medic, went through, did um, boot camp, and then my tech school training and worked my way through nursing school while I was doing all of that. Once I graduated nursing school, I went ahead and commissioned over as a nurse. And then I worked um, as a lieutenant. So started down as a butter bar, worked through the guard unit and a med group there as I was working in St. Louis as a nurse. So prior to coming on to SOST, I have been guard and reserve for my entire time. Once I did that for a little bit. I switched to the Illinois Guard, did uh, some air operations planning there, and then I decided I wanted to fly. So I switched to the reserves and flew out of Scott for about five years. Had a great time there. It was actually when I was on deployment um, with an AE crew that I kind of really started looking into sauce. I remember flying some missions and landing and being downrange and just thinking that it'd be super cool to do medicine even more forward than where we were. And that's something I've kind of always been interested in and went ahead and started looking. I was like, man, soft, they probably need nurses or medical teams, excuse me. And so found some guys that were already on the team, so reached out to them, had some questions get answered, and then decided to put my name in the hat for selection. And here I am. And now here you are. And then we crossed paths getting ready for a deployment. And then that's where yeah. that's where we met. You were supporting the best troop in the history of special tactics. Five troop. No big deal. Five, five flight. Best um, flight. Five flight. Best flight. Thank you. Put some respect on it. Uh, I, I do want to talk kind of you, you said a lot of things that people have a ton of questions on. So you started off okay. enlisted, first of all, and then you kind of got into that that medical piece. Did you know that you wanted to be in sauce from the very beginning or did you just want to do medicine? 
I've always wanted to do medicine since I was like a small kid. I wanted to be a nurse, like additionally a teacher and a gymnast and an Olympic figure skater and all those things. And then they kind of shuffle out, obviously. Um, but I sure. always Obvi- knew I wanted obviously to- I wanted to be a cowboy, right? Okay. Um, Small goals. <laughs> hey, you can still be one. Um, yeah, I really just wanted to do battlefield nursing. I remember being very small and reading. Florence Nightingale, like Claire Barton books at nausea. My mom would be like, okay, you actually have to return these now. Um, so very early on, I knew I wanted to do medicine. I actually started working in the hospital um, as a tech when I was 17. So I've been doing it for a little bit now. Um, knew I kind of wanted to join the military. My brother, he went in first, then I followed a year after him and kind of always wanted to be a flight nurse. That was big kind of goal of mine. Loved it, had a good time, but there's just always been something kind of drawing me to more forward medicine. It's always been really intriguing to me. I've always uh, wanted to kind of be in that arena and kind of just kept looking. So like I said, I didn't know sauce existed. I kind of went looking for it and found this team and I was like, that's pretty dope. That would be a really cool thing to do. And so I've loved it. I love the mission set and what it's uh, capable of. Nice. And then you were working your way towards that nursing degree, your entire, you know, enlisted career, essentially. Mm -hmm. How hard was it for you to get to that next level to that to that nursing degree? So I enlisted when I was in my junior year of college. So I paid for it myself, um, went through enlisted my junior year. I took a year off um, tech school for medics back then was nine months. So nine months off in nursing school, came back, finished my senior year. And then I commissioned as LT, I guess within a year or two, um, it wasn't, it wasn't bad. Like you just had, you were going to drill in between going to college. So you kind of have to decide what you want to do. Do you want to go party or do you want to go to drill on the weekends? But I enjoyed it. Like I've had a really great experience, um, these past many years. And like, I thought it was great. Like you get a lot of travel and a lot of opportunities that I don't think a lot of people are aware of. Yeah. 100%. 100%. And that's, that's 100% the reason why we wanted to, to bring you back on is a lot of people just like yourself have kind of the same story. You know, they want to do medicine, they do have a calling to be closer to where the fight is. They just, they just don't know that these, these teams are out there. You, yeah. uh, you did mention you had a couple of questions that you reached out to that sauced, um, the sauced team. Now I'm saying it redundantly. So you reached out to people that were yeah. currently on the sauce. <laughs> and you had, yeah. uh, you had questions for them. what were those questions? Um, I reached out to a couple of them and just sent emails like, Hey, I'm kind of curious about this. This is my background. Cause at this point I've been, I've, my whole career has been like trauma ICU. So, um, that's kind of the blood and guts is my jam. I like it. Uh, kind of gave them my background. This is what I'm looking to do. Kind of ask them what requirements they had, um, what the physical standards were and what was the process to get more information. And so they were able to provide that, um, linked me up with one of the recruiters and got information that way. Do, do you still have contacts with those recruiters? Or really what I want to know is what, what are the, the standards to get into sauce? Are we saying sauce now? Is that what we're saying? I think sauce. Sauce. Like yeah. any, yeah, any, any of us usually call it sauce, a sauce tea. We've heard the host we've heard. Um, we know what you mean, but we call it sauce. But I think it comes like the tea is like tack pea, sow tea. I don't know. Maybe that's how the sauce tea came from. I don't don't even know Uh, what we're talking about anymore. That's what you guys call it. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So to get a hold of people, um, we have a website. So if you actually just Google 24SOW, I checked it earlier to make sure I'm not telling you lies. Um, the first thing that comes up is Air Force Special Tactics page. If you click on that, it'll give you those four pillars. Um, you can just click on like, you'll see the battlefield surgery link and you can start there. Um, it should give you all the basic information of what we're looking for, what rank you have to be at to apply. Uh, we do take civilians, it's kind of been a little tricky recently and a few selections ago, we weren't taking any civilian candidates at that point. Uh, there's like certain quotas we have to meet um, like big air force numbers for physicians. So we, I'm not sure where we are exactly right now with taking civilian numbers, but we've definitely picked up many of our physicians straight off the street or out of residency and are able to come into that. Um, 
there is a recruiter. There should be a website. I can provide you guys addresses and like phone numbers if you need that after this. Yeah, no worries. I think the only thing I was concerned about is you said Google instead of DuckDuckGo, which makes me a little nervous. But um, <laughs> well, for the uh, simple there, but... person, if they just don't know what's going on, it's Google. <laughs> but that I mean, also will work. Well, what are we doing here? <laughs> for so the, I, I for the we've, advanced, we've, though. Yeah. Uh, we've covered it before, um, but like these are s- certain things about the sauce uh, that people just don't know about. And so if right. someone's walking into this blind and hasn't, um, you know, listened to our other episodes, what is a sauce? How is the team comprised? Like, what are the different requirements that y'all are looking for? And really, and what do y'all do? I'm not trying to be insulting, but like what? No, absolutely. Because I think um, even within the Air Force or in the military, still people aren't aware that teams like us exist or what our capabilities are. So it's a great question. So SOST is a six person surgical team. We are created and exist to work outside the wire. So we are basic nuts and bolts is do surgery and medium high threat environments. So of those six people, you're going to have two components. It's a surgical team and a resuscitative team. So your surgical team is a surgeon. Um, It's a general surgeon. It doesn't have to be a trauma trained fellow, but that is um, obviously something nice to have. So you'll have your surgeon, anesthesia, which can be either a CRNA or an anesthesiologist and your respiratory, or sorry, and your surgical tech. So those three kind of make up your component of your DCS. Um, Then you have your ER physician, a critical care nurse. It can be ICU or ER, and then your respiratory therapist. And that three person kind of split can go and do your damage control resuscitation. And something unique about that is we are modeled after the Air Force CCAT team. So everybody has gone through and been validated um, with those credentials and kind of can maneuver around if we need to go evac somebody. Critical care, um, air transport is CCAT for someone that's just joining. And so that's kind of our basic composition of those six And so it, it sounds like medium to high threat. So you, you're, you're hiring people that already have experience that you can throw some, uh, you know, tactical skill sets on top of and all these other things. And that way you can go into these these areas and, and do your job and perform surgery, emergency care and evac. I mean, what, what do you yeah. all not do? And also, why do we have PJs? I'm so confused. <laughs> okay. Lots nice. of questions. Okay. So big things with us, like definitely you have to be. Uh, already trained into your profession. It's not, um, you don't come into SOS and we don't put you through medical school residency, anything. So for example, your officers, you have to be an O3. You have to have several years of experience before you even apply because you think about it, it's just the six of you. You don't have your senior nurse to call. You don't have your attending to call. Like whoever you have is who you have. So you have to be kind of at the top of your field know what you're doing in that career. And then you guys, you're it. Like you're the six people that are doing the job. So to have that experience to draw from is really helpful. Um, So they come to us medically trained. Then we take you and put you through courses to get you tactically trained, be tactically proficient to be able to work in these environments. Um, By no means is SOS operators, but we are trained to make sure that we're not a risk, that we can operate in these environments and not, you know, show up and be causing more grief. Like we need to be able to handle ourselves, handle our weapons, take care of our patients and do our thing without um, being a liability to you. Really we exist as a, as a risk mitigation for that ground force commander. So as far forward as we are, as like whatever mission you guys are doing, we are there in support of it. No matter like you guys usually have um, medical personnel embedded in teams, whether it's like ODA, SEALs, a PJ, somebody there is able to do some advanced skills on medicine, right? The big bang for the buck of SOST is those torso injuries, those injuries that exist in the box. If you get shot in an extremity, that's great. You guys are awesome at um, throwing tourniquets on, doing some uh, interventions, criking, do a finger thoracostomy, things like that that you can do to start stabilizing that patient. But that person, if they have an injury, like a junctional injury, shot in the chest, things like that, that's why we exist. We want to be as close to that point of injury as possible to give you guys, your team, whoever it is, that fighting chance to save them. So that also 
like puts us in some very high risk areas, which is why we go through training. So we can grab your, grab your guy and do, do the surgery and then take off. Whether we have to evac, whether it's in a bird, a lot of our guys do, we'll do the vehicle ops. So if we have to operate transport and surgery, um, building of opportunities, things like that, we're trained to kind of work whatever the environment is, whatever the mission dictates. Um, there's been several different ones out there. So just as the mission changes, that's kind of how our tactics change. And we try and train to that to be prepared, whatever you guys need help with. And with, that, with that kind of training, and, and you guys have a lot, just, just like we do, you have a lot of um, currency requirements and stuff like that, that you have to yeah. stay on top of. And, and I'm, and I'm sure just like us, it's extremely challenging. So as you are training to shoot, move, communicate kind of thing, um, like how often are you guys going and doing, you know, small unit tactics, shooting courses, driving and so on? Yeah. So initially when you get picked up in selection, you will go through and start our pipeline training that, has kind of changed over the years, but roughly, let's say it's like four to five months start to finish if everything goes well. In your initial pipeline training, that's when you get your first um, your first courses. So drive, um, really we're trying to just teach you the basics of how to shoot, move, and communicate and operate in a soft environment. Again, not teaching anybody how to be operators, but how to work proficiently in this environment. Uh, you'll go through tactical driving. you go through a shooting course um, land nav, things like that, uh, go through the air commando school and kind of get your basis for that. Um, our main focus obviously is medicine. So most of our requirements are coming from the medical side, which is awesome that we're working in these civilian hospitals is like, we're just crushing it. Like we get all the blood and guts, all the trauma, all the cases, um, and the volume and the reps required to be able to do this, which is a fantastic opportunity. And it's like a really nice setup um, for tactical training. We usually will do that in our spin up phase. So as the teams are rotating through, we'll see what AOR we're going to, what teams we're attached to, what kind of mission set we're going to be walking into. And that kind of drives how the team lead will determine what our spin up is. Um, additionally, all these events need OCTs or white cells. So that's kind of how people that aren't in deployment will go through and kind of pick up on, on getting extra reps in. Okay, cool. So, and I love that you actually mentioned this because you said you're working in civilian hospitals. So mm -hmm. in garrison or, or when you're not deployed, like you guys are kind of disaggregated. Um, yeah. Uh, at least from from what I understand. So could you go into that a little bit of when you're back here, like how are you guys kind of not necessarily I'm not looking for, you know, comrel or, or command relationships or anything like that. Yeah. But like, you know, for, for us, we're we're an entity. We are like we are training together and we're doing that kind of stuff. Maybe, you know, if, if Aaron needs some medical refresher or something like that, he goes and does that while I go do, you know, some close air support or something like that. But mm -hmm. But you guys are just kind of you know, scattered? Yeah. Um, yeah, great question. So SOST is very unique in the fact that we are kind of separated from, I would say the big blue. Um, we are detachment. So detachment one is in Birmingham, Alabama at UAB hospital. And debt two is in Vegas. They work at UMC hospital. Um, they're up in Vegas. So those are the two locations that SOST exists. Um, the cool thing about them is that they were contracted to work in the local hospital. So it's kind of like one of those premier uh, military civilian partnerships, which we have found is awesome. Like, as you guys know, the military hospitals, MTFs, we're just not doing trauma cases like this. They're usually um, like vets or like it's healthy cases. You're not having people that are um, coming in at the sheer volumes that you do in the city of hospital. So that for the trauma aspect and med reps is phenomenal. Um, the partnerships have been so welcoming. Like it's been a really great place to work. I'm at Birmingham. So I work at UAB and the ER is great. I mean, we get the trauma cases. Um, you can work days or nights, weekends, like kind of whatever works with the scheduling. Um, and then another really unique thing about SOST is in addition to working at a civilian hospital, you also pull trauma call together. So 
once you get through sauce and pipeline, you get put on a team once you arrive on station and you basically you stay with that team for your duration of your time there. So I've been with my same team since I've arrived and that really allows you to like train and work together in all the scenarios. So like the same guys I've been with, I've been with the whole time. So when our surgeon takes trauma call, the team goes down and takes call overnight with him. So what that looks like is uh, my surgeon's uh, Mark Northern, he'll take call. All of us will go in with him. And no matter what it is, like we'll work in the trauma, we'll run that trauma. If that patient needs to go up to surgery, we'll go up to surgery. And during trauma call is when we get to practice our advanced skills. So for a nurse, normally my day-to-day practice, I am not going to intubate, cry, put chest tubes in. Like I work as a as a normal nurse within my scope. Uh, same thing with respiratory therapists or my scrub techs. And their day-to-day job, they're not pushing meds. They're not intubate or RT might, but they're not uh, pushing meds, putting chest tubes and things like that. So in team trauma call, that's when we get to work with those surgeons. So I can work on my advanced skills. I can go to the OR. I can work on my airways. Um, I'll take my text and be like, all right, we're going to drop these meds, draw this meds, push this, and really give them that chance to um, work on the skills that they're going to be doing downrange. That's fantastic. So you guys get to train together the entire time in a real world scenario. And that just helps you get prepared for that, for that next move. That's a, that's awesome to hear. And that's completely different than it used to be. You used to kind of play this pickup game where you'd be like, Oh, we need, you know, this many people and we're just going to kind of like show up for this spin up and, and, you know, hope it works out. But you guys, uh, I, I can't say enough good things about the program at UAB. You obviously know how how much I like the Sockman program and what it's what what's yep. happening at UAB. But uh, I want to talk about you talked about some of those team positions, right? People always ask us if I am this specific career field, can yep. I assess for SOST? Um, can you can you lay out what what AFSCs that you guys accept, and then we're going to talk about kind of that lead up to you know the application process and then assessment and selection. Sure. Yeah. So currently we still have the six members that I listed out. So your surgeon, general surgeon, uh, anesthesia can be an anesthesiologist or a CRNA and your surgical tech, an ER doc, your critical care nurse, or it can be, we'll take ER nurses as well. And then your respiratory therapist. Right now, those are the only six that we're accepting. Recently, there was a higher level debate about bringing additional people in. Um, I feel like every couple of years it kind of goes through it. Like I remember even when I first came in, they were talking about looking at the composition of the teams. So very recently that was just brought up again about um, IDMTs, PJs, MPs, and what that looks like. So as it still stands, it's still just the six people that will be on the team. Um, whether that changes in the future, I'm not sure, but um, that's kind of, where it works, how it fits with our with our model right now. Obviously, we are integrating. We have the PGA program at UAB. Um, IDMTs are out there. So how does that look integrating in the future? That's kind of up in the air right now, but obviously always trying to um, provide better training and collaboration with other disciplines. Um, and then something else that has to be considered when we talk about this is right now, like people will say, okay, well, let's just add somebody else to the mix. And it might be that easy, but we have these partnerships within the hospitals. So you have to consider like how, where does that person go? So if you were to add a PJ right. or a nurse practitioner, like that brings on a whole nother question of how do they work now in the civilian sector? Because our surgeon is, he counts as like faculty in the hospital. So he takes his trauma call, takes all his service. We, the rest of us kind of are a plug and play, which is really helpful because the staff can't depend on us to be there all the time. What if we get deployed, pulled away, things like that. So it's multi, uh, multi-level multi things to look at. But to answer your question right now, it's those six uh, career fields. And then, like I said, who knows? It's always evolving as we go. Right. And for those six career fields, they'll hit the website. We'll put the we'll put the website and all the links and stuff. We'll put them in the yeah. uh, comments of the YouTube. So that that's an easy one. So perfect. When they they're ready to make this step, right? When they're mm-hmm. when they're ready to step up to the sauce, they're gonna email, they're gonna reach out to the recruiters, and then how long does it actually take for their, you know, their packet to get 
uh, reviewed? How many times are you running selection a year? That's kind of like a common question. Do you guys do a spring selection and a fall selection or what does that process look like? Yeah. So if you email the, the listed address, it should be, I, I don't want to speak for anybody and I know there's lots of changes, but I would imagine within a week or so you should get a response back. Um, if not, definitely always follow up and be like, Hey, just following back, making sure that you receive this, um, for selection. We do run several a year. It kind of depends on our numbers, like how many we're looking to recruit. Obviously, you always have to be thinking about bringing in the next next class. We usually have two to three per year. We just did one in March, and I'm pretty positive that the sauce, um, the phase one application is just closed because our phase two, which is the in-person selection, that is happening in August. So I'm pretty sure the deadline for the the summer one has just closed, but I can get back to you with actual dates on that. But we normally do two to th- two to three per year for that selection. Um, okay, so you emailed, you dropped uh, some information, you decide you want to put a package in. You go onto that website, and it has your application that you can download. So selection is two parts. Uh, Part one is um, just an on paper, um, it's your application. So they will review that packet. And then based on that, they'll either deem you a viable candidate and invite you to a selection, which is phase two, or they'll give you kind of feedback and be like, no, you didn't uh, meet the requirements, kind of give you feedback, go from there. So phase two selection is a one week long in person. It's down at Hurlburt Field. So that is when we will put you through some physical stressors, mental stressors, um, kind of test you, see what kind of person you are, um, and kind of really dig a little deeper to see if that's the type of person, the candidate that, w- that we want on the teams. Right. And that's important for people to hear. Like you are selecting people out that are already established in their career fields. They're already good anesthetists. They're already good surgeons. They're yeah. already good nurses. So at that in, in person, especially that phase two, um, you know, first question, of course, like how physically fit should they be? We know that your main your main job is medicine, right? Yes. But we're asking you to do a little bit more. So what does that fitness level really look like for applicants? Oh, boy. Um, OK, so on the, <laughs> on the website, it gives you your physical standards. Uh, the black and white letter as it stands is that you have to have like above a 90 on your PT test. Which I will on tell you that PT test. on Got your it. Air Force PT test. <laughs> uh, if you ask right. anybody in SAUCE, that's kind of still a hot topic. And we are actually trying. We would love to work towards more standards. Um, but when people ask me, how do I? How do you train for our selection? How do you train for SAUCE? I'll be like, all right, just think about it. Like, What is the actual job? You're probably going to be carrying patients. You probably should be able to do that. You already know that we carry our medicine. Like everything we do is out of a ruck. So your ruck's um, fairly heavy. So you need to be able to do that. Um, Some people come in and you can, you can tell the people that have definitely trained and like have the intent to pass the physical standards. Um, And then we've had people come that, I mean, they can't do push ups. So I would say we won't not select you just because you might not be able to do pull-ups or run super fast. Um, But you have to be able to do the job. And also this is a professional job that you're coming to. So you should put forth the effort um, and present yourself in the best lights. Um, Because you can definitely, definitely tell the people that have trained for it and not. And it's not just for a selection, like that is going to carry you through pipeline and then your job and through your team day workouts. Yeah, get it. And then um, what are some of those other, you know, everybody's looking for attributes, right? And yeah. usually we say you're looking for that person you want to spend some time with in the team. Absolutely. Because as you well know, as you well know, you're going to be in a tent somewhere with these yep. five other people and you're going to have to live with them. So what are some of those things that you guys look for at assessment selection to be like, okay, they're a great doctor, but they're also awesome in the team. Do they need to be a pilot that races cars on the weekends and <laughs> looks really good or can they be different? They can absolutely be different. We really look, uh, it's right. It's the right person. Like people will ask and like, I even asked the questions as I was getting, it was like, all right, what kind of person are you looking for? Like, how do I best 
uh, fit in? How do I do this? And the best advice I got was just be yourself. The program is designed to weed you out. Like there's so many people watching. You have your cadre there, psych there, and then your peer evals are all there. Like your true self is going to get kind of drawn out. So just be yourself. We want to know who you are and what you bring to the table. Um, you might not be the smartest, the fastest, the best, like the best at land nav, but you still might be the right person for the team. Like we can teach you those things, but I can't teach you kind of how to be a good person, how to get along with the team, how to have that internal drive. Um, I feel like humility is a thing that kind of comes up a lot of qualities that we're looking at. Like, are you able to just do the job? Are you able to help your teammates out? Can you take charge? Can you be a good leader? Can you be a good follower at times, especially being in the, our career field? We have a lot of type A personality. So uh, especially when you get a lot of positions in the room, like who's the team lead, who wants to lead? Okay. Now you're not in charge this time. Like you have to follow. So um, kind of looking at all that interpersonal um Working relations, things like that, that's kind of the person we're looking for. And like you said, absolutely, if you're going to get stuck and trapped somewhere, whether it's in a truck or dirt or a tent and in not great situations and you're tired and hungry and crabby, like who's the person that you're fine just hanging out? They're like, all right, let's just do it. Yeah, it was weird. It makes sense. And it's almost like we've heard these things before from everybody that has a selection course everywhere. And yet... Uh, but the the question also that comes up a lot is we're going to be asked point blank. I don't know how many times coming up here soon. What is the failure rate at the uh, phase two? Like how many people get selected out of every class percentage wise, yada, yada. Yeah. It's an unfair question, uh, but I'm asking it anyway. No, that's fine. I cannot give you an exact number because it's really dependent. Like sometimes we've had very large classes. Um, I think this last one that we went through had maybe 12 like so we'll have 12 to 19 people and some selections will only have three to five um then it also depends on which afscs are coming we've had some selections where all we needed are nurses and we had no nurses so it's like okay so we're full up on this on this afsc and so i can't it's not like we won't just like fail the whole class but we still are looking for that quality over quantity um and same token, like we're not going to take the whole class just because like we're looking for AFCs. Like you have to find the right person um, and still like kind of abide by that selection system. I'm sorry, I don't have like the actual percentage number because it. Like, How it dare looks, you? How dare you I not know. have exact uh, I numbers? I will find out and circle back. You're going to get roasted in the comments for not telling anybody answers now. Congratulations, ma'am. Yeah. Thank I just so want much. them to be mad at you and not us when you okay, didn't have the exact me. number. Okay, it was me. I did it. Um, I will find you a number. Make promises you can't deliver on. Yeah, yeah, I didn't don't. say it's the right number, People be but I'll get back. you a number. People be following up. You'll get a comment 32 weeks from now. It's like, diss you, and it's your comment that you would just, you, you'll you get these numbers out. It's terrible. Don't read oh. the comments. So. All right, uh, fair it's enough. Rough. <laughs> uh, as, as far as advice, though, um, I, I get this sometimes, the humility thing. We talk about humility a lot, but how do you yeah. straddle that line between humility and also knowing that you're good at your job, being good at your job and being confident going into the selection course. Yeah. Um, I think, let's see, what's the best way to answer this? I think you have to like go into it. Or I guess a better question is like, why do you want to do this job? Like if you're coming in to do this job to like make headlines or like further advance your career, which like some people do and that's fine. Like, and that's like every job. Um, you just have to like, I think, reflect back and see where is that balance of like, we will, we ultimately are here for one purpose and one purpose only is like, we're here to make sure like you guys get home that any guy that we're out there or girl, um, any of those guys, like, that's why we're here. That's why we train. So no, your point of being good, that is like, that's why you're here and doing this job. So you, you definitely should be confident and they tell us like, you should be the best in your career field. That is the whole reason we're here. We're making like the best team to give you guys the best try uh, fighting chance when you're out there, you're putting your life on the line. All these guys running these missions, like that's our whole reason of existing is to make sure that we are able to look at you in the eye and be like, I got you. I'll take care of you. We'll get you back home. 
Um, and I think if you keep that kind of focus in mind, like they'll keep you on the, the right path, the right mindset of like why you're actually doing this job. Okay. That was an okay answer, I guess. Okay. You didn't really answer my question. You just took my, my question and, and answered what you wanted to. I'm just playing. Um, okay. okay so I love it. I yeah. love it. Passable. Okay. Passable. Yeah, yeah. No. So, but, but you, you did say something that's, that's incredibly important to me, I think. And we talked about this with uh Trey free uh, as well. The, the being good at your job before you even put in the phase one selection uh, paperwork, right? Like you're not going to accept people that are, half-assing their jobs in the regular air force and then just trying to escape and thinking they're going to turn it on and become this like, you know, perfect tactical surgeon person out in the field. Exactly. Yeah. And like it is, you do get to do a lot of cool things. It is a cool job. Um, for those guys that like want to go out and be in the dirt and do this, this is great. But also it's like any other job, like you have your fair amount of things that are just completely ridiculous like everything's a pain and like some days it really sucks. Like it's uh, I feel like you have to keep that in mind when like you're trying to chase kind of these, uh, the cool guy jobs as people say. So um, I think like it's every job, like every job can be really cool. and has its really great days. And then we're like, you're going through your growing pains or your stuff that you just really hate and you just have to make the best of it no matter where you are. Yeah. Some days, every single job sucks. Like, that's just the reality of it. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> At some levels, for sure. Hey, so one of the things that um, I, I was kind of curious on, and I don't know if I, I missed it, uh, either talking to you or, or talking to Ray, but how long are these assignments uh, for you? And I and I guess it'd probably be specific to AFSC, but like, how long, if somebody's wanting to do this and they came in, how, how long can they actually realistically do sauce tea? Yeah. So it's usually an assignment is the best answer. So that's like your four years. However, finding people that want to do this job, specifically your surgeons and your physicians, like not only do you have to find somebody that wants to join the military and do this and wants to go through all that training to be a surgeon, but now you have to find the right person that wants to do this in these conditions in the dirt, like not making what you're going to make on the outside. So our surgeons have a little bit more retainability and that flexibility. Um, nursing, RT, scrub techs, it's a little bit different, like your um, career field. It just, I think it changes with who you're, uh, who you are working with at the time. Um, there's an opportunity to get reclamate, so you can get an extension if you have a shortage in those positions. Um, all of us coming in, obviously, we'd love to stay. Um, I think the longest we've had is kind of like six years and then they're pushing people to go back to the, to their career fields and do that. So unlike any of you guys in special tactics sauce at this point is not a career progression. It is one, maybe two assignments. Right. Yeah. I mean, but I mean, two assignments can take you to to eight years, eight, 10 years of of doing this job for sure. And I, I know that there is, there is a want and a need within, at least within special tactics to retain the talent that we've already assessed and selected to, you know, because I, you, you said it yourself, it's, it, it is difficult to find folks like yourself that are willing to um, like put yourself out there, put yourself in those kind of situations with that kind of training and expertise that you already have. Yeah. Plus, uh, and, and, and you mentioned it, like, you you could make a lot more money on the outside, but you don't. You choose to do this job because uh, for righteous reasons, because, you know, you know that you can provide a certain amount of of skill and expertise to help bring, you know, warriors back um, and save their lives potentially. So I, I think that's that's notable, um, not notable, but noble rather. Um, so one of the things that I, I guess I got to ask is is yeah i'm interested in medicine but hey listen i have no business doing any kind of medicine we can put that out right now if nobody uh nobody already knew that but like i want to hear like people want to hear stories right so i i guess for me what would be a, a kick-ass like really uh awesome story that you have whether it was in garrison or deployed uh that you could enlighten me with 
Sure. Um, I'll give you just kind of an example of like what we do garrison side that gives us that opportunity to be ready and good at our jobs on range. So one of our trauma calls, uh, we were actually working with some PJs at the time. They were rotating through, so they hopped on this one as well. Um, of we course, had a they patient did. PJs that- just always <laughs> hopping on. It, it's your show, and you just look around, and you you got three extra dudes. Like, who are you guys? We're like, oh, don't worry about us. We'll just we'll be we'll be right over here if you need us. <laughs> hey, it works. That's why you guys are there to get reps too. So. Yeah, I mean, you just get the patients that come in that are the multiple gunshots. Uh, so we had this uh, gentleman that was shot. Um, he was probably shot seven times. So it was one of those. You never wish ill on the patient, but you're like, all right, this is like he's getting all the things. He's getting intubated, cracked the chest tubes, all the additional procedures, all the lines. Um, then he was a surgical case, too, because a lot of times we'll get patients in the trauma bay that maybe don't need to go surgery right away. So us being us, we're like, yes, we get to go up to the OR and follow him up and like work on that case. Um, It was just like one of those times where it was just our team in the room that we got to work on that. Um, Take care of him, follow him through all that continuing on with care. Um, Like those days are fun. Like my favorite days in the trauma bay are when it's just like chaos and mayhem and there's just everything going on. It's usually For me, I find it the most fun. Some days it's a little stressful, but like that's when I enjoy it the most. (laughs) Um, My worst day in somebody's life, too. (laughs) It is, but we're there. We're going to take great care of you. You're going to be okay. Um, (laughs) It's medical people are sick. This dude got shot seven times. They're like, they all start throwing a party. They're like, woo, we're we're going. This is going to be great training. (laughs) Not that you ever want anybody to be injured, but. If you ask anybody that works in that kind of environment, they're like, all right, this is a good case. We're going to do great. <laughs> when Jared was like, Peach is like, oh, uh, I'm just going to ask about a story here. I'm like, do not ask a nurse about her story. She's not going to be able to right, tell like, any just story, going. good, right. bad, or indifferent. Like, you don't know where this is going to go. It's, yeah. It's, it gave you like a very PR story. We'll have an offline conversation. <laughs> Well, that's where we'll have to start a Patreon channel so that we can really go into like our oh, family. Like, yeah, no shit. It. There Let's I was. Go. Okay. <laughs> we have them for sure. Yeah, there's a lot. But So another thing that people, ask, that people ask a, a, a ton, right, is like how many times are they going to get to go deploy, right? You don't have to tell us about deployment cycles or anything else, but that's a, a big question. When people talk about sauce, they're like, Hey, here's what I want to do. I want to go downrange and do the job. I know I have a finite kind of like career that's laid mm-hmm. out before me. So how many times can can a new SOST member expect to deploy once they're fully qualified? Uh, that, uh, let's say, like we follow along with ST's like after-stint cycle. So along that kind of, uh, that tempo. Um, ideally, we like to have a team that is, deploying and then obviously the world is a crazy place so as things pop off we are able to cover down on whatever things that are happening if we need to send additional teams out um in a four-year time period given the state of affairs now let's go with two times (laughs) i like it there are the two times out there but like I said, it's so, like, it's so variable. Like you guys all know, like you either get short noticed or you fill in for somebody else or this position's missing or everything's going on at once and they have to send multiple teams. Like it's uh, it's kind of a moving target and exa- um, with kind of the drawback and everything right now, as you guys are doing the same thing, I'm sure is kind of restructuring and looking like what is the mission moving forward? How do we, how do we work from here? Awesome. I have a question that I'm not I'm not sure on. Uh, oh. When you guys get downrange, yeah. Sorry, I just kind of jumped in. I was texting, and Aaron, I was like, Aaron, <laughs> can you like break this down for me? And he's like, just just ask the question. So like, here I am. He's, and I'm he's back. like, ask. He's got this big question. He's like, hey, ask. I can't even read what it says on the. Okay. On the t- I'm just like, <laughs> just you're in, buddy. It. Go I'm ahead. Ready. Look, I'm not <laughs> I'm not medical. I don't get excited when people get shot. So I I thought Aaron would be the best for this. <laughs> um. So, so when a, a, a SOST gets in country, like, how do you, 
how do you establish all your relationships with all the teams? How do you get to where you're going? Like how much of that is personality driven where you guys like have to just show up and be like, Hey, this is who we are. This is what we do. If a, B and C happens, like tag us in coach and, and, and how chaotic is that uh, situation? Yeah. So that's a great question. And it's something that is um, extremely important because that basically sets up and dictates like how that rotation is going to go. So usually we land in country. Hopefully we've had some pre-communication. Our team lead usually take point and reach out to like guys on ground or like whatever sauce team we're tagging out, kind of get some like background essay on what's going on. Um, But arrive boots on ground and team lead team sergeant usually will go and meet like whatever team lead that we're supporting, whether it's NSW, ODA, anything like that, um, and meet with that ground force commander. And it's really um, important that we meet with that ground force commander, give them our capes brief, kind of understand what his mission is, what his intent for his area of responsibility is, and kind of how we fit into that. So we've had, I would say historically, most of SAUCE has supported ODA teams, um, just from like the guys that I know have been out. So that's like a very different mission set. Um, they're running outside the wire, running convoys, things like that. My personal experience has been more with NSW. So they just, it just kind of looks different, but the same message is there. Like we exist to go with you outside the wire to those medium high threats. So if there is an op going on, like how do we fit in? How do we support that? How, we're there to be that risk mitigation. So the higher the risk, like the more you want us there so that you can kind of help mitigate that. And we're there in the event, God forbid, something something goes wrong. But I think having to reiterate our capabilities um, is sometimes important just because you don't really, I don't want to say it generally, but sometimes you're not thinking about those medical plans until like something goes wrong. And like, we just have to make sure that we're all on the same page of like, if this goes down, how, how would you like to see us? Um, a lot of times we'll go out with the guys. Um, our, our purpose is not to be on the X. Like we want to be offset. Like us being on the X is not a great idea and we can't do medicine there. Like you guys are existing to hit your objective, do whatever mission you have. And then maybe we're avoiding, maybe we're in the aircraft, maybe we're in a building of opportunity, but the, we want to be as close as possible. Like everybody talks about the golden hour that you want us close, but kind of the new, um, not even new, but more of our drive that we're pushing for is we want to be within 15 minutes. Like if you took an injury to the chest or to your stomach um, in that box area that we're talking about, like an hour might be too long. Like if you're going to need us, you're going to need us right then. You're going to need us right there. So we can grab you and start doing work. That means like we can fly and do surgery. We can get in the truck and do surgery. We can hop on the boat, things like that. Um, So it's really important to have that communication with your ground force commander um, and with the team lead of those, of those teams that you're supporting. So for all of those people that want to do this, for those mm-hmm. people that want to go out and they want to be that far forward asset there within 15 minutes at point of injury, ready to do no kidding, like open chest surgery on people to save them. Yeah. What would you, what advice would you give to those people that want to come in and do this job? I would say just uh, keep trying, like make sure you're, you're the best at what you do. Um, take honest accountability of yourself. Like we always say, like it is a very, um, I don't want to say like professional and like you have a a lot of autonomy and that freedom within the hospital to kind of like work on your skills that you need. So it takes a lot of um, internal reflection to be like, all right, maybe I'm not the best at starting IVs. I need to do this or maybe like I need to work better on ultrasound. So it's up to me to know that, that I need to go work with my ear docs or go find somebody to do that. Um, I found that on trauma calls, everybody's trying to fight for the airway. So me personally, I go up to the OR with my anesthesiologist on a completely different day and be like, Hey, can I come do all your start cases and intubate patients and just work on my skills that way? So I'd say for somebody that really wants to do this, like take time to internally reflect, like, what are you good at? What are you bad at? Like what scares you? Um, and how can you be better? And I think that will push you in that right direction of, of getting there. Absolutely awesome. And what a great place to end. 
Oh, great. Thanks for coming on. We really appreciate it. Yeah, right? thanks. Big clap. Yeah, thanks for having me. That's we appreciate great. it. Hopefully I answered yeah, all, no, it was all your awesome. Thanks for coming on. I didn't on. answer one, but uh, I got one follow-up and some data to come, come up with. <laughs> You're doing great. So the so the question is, is, was it as bad as you thought it would be? Really? No, 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 not at all. I just uh, yeah, it was great. I was glad. I love it. I love how nervous it. you'd gotten up until yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Well. Yep. Major Alfred, thanks for coming on. We really appreciate it. For everybody out there that wants to check out, go to that 24Sal webpage and check out the application process. Everything's in there to include the deadline for that phase one, phase two that she was talking about earlier in the podcast. As always, thanks for following and keeping up with the project. We appreciate you for coming on, Major Alfred, and we will see you sooner rather than later, probably somewhere around the UAB area. So appreciate you coming on. Thanks for everybody else out there. Train hard. Have a good thanks, one. Guys. Later. Later.